a judgment day for Steve Bannon. The prosecution resting after calling the witnesses that they say will prove Bannon's guilt and send him to prison. We're going to get into this with Mr. Gerstein, as I mentioned, but there is a method to the speed of the DOJ prosecutors. They are conveying to these jurors that this ain't a complex case and you only need two witnesses to prove it. One of them was the FBI agent who spoke out today and shredded what may have been one of Bannon's only defenses if you're following the facts. It's the claim that we reported on last night. Bannon's lawyers say that Bannon wanted to cooperate and this was somehow a misunderstanding. Well, today, this agent, who I can now report is half of the entire witness block of the prosecutors, this agent said under oath that Bannon's lawyer was informed of the deadline for the subpoena the whole time and never even claimed or mentioned that he or his client were confused about it. So that's what the defense has to deal with. And it backs up testimony that Congress officially warned Bannon of the possible criminal charges if he defied the subpoena, which we know he went ahead and did. Prosecutors are pushing evidence that Bannon knew what he was getting into, while the defense was pushing questions like this about whether Congress had asked former President Trump to explore getting rid of executive privilege. And that drew this reply in court. The answer is no. The assumption of your question, this was directed at the Bannon side, the president had exerted privilege, is not accurate. No privilege, no excuse, and no confusion about the law that Bannon was breaking. That's DOJ's argument. For his part, Bannon speaking out on the court steps again today, making the odd claim about who gets to talk and who's being forced into silence. I'm going to address this on the other side of this clip. The global elites, the Financial Times of London, everybody on the city of London, Wall Street, the multinational corporations, they're the ones trying to shut me up. They will never shut me up and never shut me down. The man indicted for refusing to talk now says other people are trying to shut him up, to silence him. Now, as a factual matter, Mr. Bannon could have talked and testified like other witnesses. Had he faced Congress, which is what he's legally required to do, it's not supposed to be any kind of choice, had he done that and then walked out to hold a press conference or do interviews, they would be covered. He is one of the last people in the world who can claim that he doesn't have access to be heard, amplified, platformed. And by the way, his colleagues have talked under oath and on TV and even on this program. The only person who muzzled Bannon is Bannon which is why some legal experts think his current defense is an uphill battle and maybe why the DOJ is taking this bold, bullish strategy to tell the jurors there's not much to see here, it doesn't take long to explain, now make up your mind. As promised, we turn to really the perfect guest we could get tonight, Josh Gerstein, a legal affairs reporter for Politico. He has had many scoops in his day. If you're watching the news, you've probably watched him on the news before. Today he's here because he's been recover covering this and was inside that courtroom today. Welcome to the beat, sir. Hey, Ari, good to be back with you. Absolutely. Tell us about resting the case this fast. How did that play out in the room? Well, it, it was pretty abrupt. That FBI witness you mentioned, Stephen Hart, was on the stand, I would say, for only 15 or 20 minutes, maybe. He was the... Uh, second prosecution witness. And after very brief examination and cross-examination, uh, you know, a couple questions about a, a proper session Bannon's attorney made uh, where there didn't seem to be any mention that Bannon didn't know there was a deadline or was looking for an extension. They posted a couple of uh, getter postings from Bannon's getter account that showed him boasting about uh, not complying with the subpoena. Uh, and after a little bit of cross-examination, that was about it. And uh, one of the prosecutors stood up and said, uh, and the, the government rests. And so, uh, you know, we're going to go tomorrow morning into some motions, and then uh, perhaps we'll see a defense case or not. But I think uh, most of us were pretty surprised. But it's definitely a sign, as you say, Ari, that the prosecution is confident that they can persuade the jury this is very simple. Mr. Bannon was subpoenaed. He didn't show up. And he has delivered zero documents to the committee of the many, many categories of documents they've asked for. You've covered a, a lot of legal issues in your day, sir. 
could you glean any reaction from the judge, the jury, uh, or Mr. Bannon himself uh, when abruptly, as you said, these prosecutors said, we rest? Uh, I don't think they were that surprised. The prosecution had indicated that it really didn't plan more than maybe two or three witnesses uh, total all along. They've always been saying this is a very simple case. Uh, Bannon was upset a little bit earlier in the government's case when there was discussion uh, about this meeting his lawyer had. He seemed to feel it was dirty pool for an FBI agent to be testifying about his lawyer's meeting with prosecutors from the U.S. Attorney's Office and what he said and what he didn't say, but the judge allowed the testimony. I, I could see, though, that Bannon was shaking his head. He was turning a little red in the courtroom, hmm. but, you know, within minutes he was out on the steps doing his thing uh, once again, not showing that he'd been knocked off his stride at all. Right, and you're someone who has that front row seat, so you see the difference between that brash presentation we're getting day after day, waving the newspapers around or what have you, uh, and what's actually happening in court, as I'll remind viewers, uh, the federal court rules do not allow cameras in court. So we have the sketches, we have you, and as you say, it sounds like uh, as a smart defendant, he may have known and reacted in real time to what have been setbacks. Uh, the, the parts of this case that have had back and forth have been fairly limited. We, we read one here in the opening news, Josh, about the fact that they didn't have privilege. That seemed to get shot down. I want to read from your reporting about another little moment where you say that some of the questions verged on the quote absurd. Uh, one witness asked there, do you read nonfiction? Uh, I believe this is by the cross-exam by Bannon's lawyer. Is it accurate to say most of the members of your book club worked together as Democratic staff or one of the committees? And it went on like that. Um, since you reported it, uh, walk us through what that little absurdity was, but also what uh, I, I suppose it may convey about the, the limits or the thin reed that the defense uh, questions are built on right now. Right, Ari. So the uh, defense is trying to suggest that uh, because uh, one time Kristen Ammerling, who's the chief counsel for the January 6th committee, uh, has been part of a book club that's been going for a decade and a half here in Washington uh, with some other staffers from Democratic committees on the Hill, one of whom also is the prosecutor uh, on this case currently and has been a prosecutor for several years here. She says she doesn't know uh, the prosecutor well, but they do happen to be members of the same book club. And we saw the defense devote some time to that issue uh, today, I think, trying to suggest this is a Democratic vendetta. Uh, I do think, I will say, Ari, I think that Bannon has a little better chance than people are suggesting because his lawyers have been pretty skillful at backdooring in many of the theories that the judge has ruled out as legal defenses. So executive privilege is not a legal defense for Bannon uh, at this trial, but the jury learned about uh, the claims of executive privilege. You know, the fact that Bannon uh, offered a couple weeks ago to come in and testify in a confusing and you know conditional kind of offer uh, is not a defense to the charges in this case. Yet today, the jury learned about uh, Bannon's offer to come in and testify. And so the defense has been, as I say, um, fairly successful in letting the jurors know about these arguments uh, that the judge may tell the jury to disregard. Of course, we never know in the final analysis whether one or two jurors might latch on to one of those things and perhaps refuse to convict for that reason. Yeah, Josh, I hope people are listening closely because uh, we can't predict anything in this business, but we know we will be covering the end of this case, whether that is a conviction, a not guilty verdict or a mistrial. We will cover the end of it. Um, and if it is short of a conviction, it may very well be for the reason you just said. The judge will tell legally the jurors um, that all of that last minute talk about maybe I'll come in if it's live, maybe I'll come in if it's prime time. I mean, not legally significant offers as we've covered. Uh, but if they get that in and one or two jurors get confused about that, or even though the judge says that's not a defense, if they think that and it sways them, as the rule is, reasonable doubt in their mind, uh, that could make a big difference. So I appreciate you pointing out uh, all of the sides of the case here tonight uh, for our coverage, Josh. Thank you.